Welcome to this week's episode of Insights. During this week's show, we're going to cover multiple topics. Uh, the first one is going to be the Prime Minister's visit to Iran. Uh, the second is going to be what appears to be uh, Armenia's pivot, a foreign policy pivot to the West, uh, and the very clear and apparent reactions from the RAF regime to that pivot. Uh, and lastly, uh, further, more sad confirmations of RAF's latest war crimes. We're going to start with our first topic of the week, which is the Prime Minister's visit to Iran. Uh, About 10 days ago, after a flurry of activities in the Russian city of Sochi, uh, in negotiations with uh, Vladimir Putin and the dictator from Baku, the Armenian Prime Minister made an impromptu visit uh, to visit his counterparts in Iran. Uh, Very little is discussed uh, or released about what they were uh, discussing. It could have been about security matters, it could have been about energy matters. The only thing that was publicly released was an extension of an agreement between Armenia and Iran that swaps uh, um, Armenian electricity exports for Iranian gas exports through the pipeline that goes through Sunik into uh, Armenia. And those electricity lines obviously go through Sunik exporting electricity to Iran. Uh, and obviously there's a geopolitical component with this because uh, the world actually wants us to have alternatives to Russian gas and actually to get away from being entirely dependent or mostly dependent on Russian gas resources and this uh, gas plant actually gives us that opportunity. Uh, What is underlying this and we're going to move on to this uh, what I call this the shift to the west um, or our much broader uh, uh, palette of foreign policy as far as the way we approach the world is what we're seeing is a pattern of triangulation between essentially three power centers in the world. It is the United States and the West, even though they're not always the same in their interests. There's obviously Russia, who's a local hegemon, uh, and Iran. Those are the three countries that we sort of pivot and and triangulate between. Now, all of these power centers have, uh, in some cases, violent uh, issues with each other uh, or general rivalries. And uh, it is uh, vital for us to be able to balance these relationships out between all of these different powers and actually use them to our benefit uh, without actually uh, getting into uh, the crossfire between them. Uh, What's interesting is that we have commonalities of interest with each of these different centers of power with the West when it comes to economic development or democratic development with Russia specifically on the issue of the status of Artsakh, which both this government and Russia says is something that needs to be resolved later, uh, and with Iran on the matter of Sunik. Uh, uh, however, and what's interesting is that uh, none of these interests that have uh, issues with each other are really about us, it's about other factors. We just get caught in the middle of it, which actually gives us an opportunity to be able to work this out, triangulate this, and to use all of these rivalries uh, not only as a uh, as something that can be problematic, but as something that can actually be useful to our interests. Another example of this pattern that we're seeing is uh, right after the meetings in Sochi uh, between the three leaders, uh, you had in Washington a meeting uh, with uh, between the Armenian Foreign Minister the American foreign minister and the, the, the foreign minister of the Baku regime. So what you're seeing is this constant tit for tat. If there's something going on with the Russians, the Americans respond with their own summit. Something the Americans do or the EU does, the Russians immediately respond. And, I, and as, as I said, many people see this as uh, problematic. Uh, I really don't because if you actually play your card right, what we're actually seeing is that all sides are being far more solicitous uh, of our positions than they were, for example, prior to the September 13th invasion of Armenia. And this is something that we need to manage. I am not sure if our diplomatic teams are capable of managing this, but this is something that if we actually manage to make work can be actually quite beneficial to this country. Now, what has been the response to all of this from the LAF regime in Baku? And it's quite interesting. Uh, If you look at the public rhetoric, and it's actually quite easy to follow, because as we know, there's absolutely no free press in that country. Uh, Almost anything that is put out in the media is actually controlled, and it's deliberate. It's a deliberate messaging by the government on who they like today, who they hate today. And uh, their media has actually taken a very dramatic anti-Western turn. And this, this sort of the, you know, they go from what I call, you know, the, uh, the 15 minutes of hate from this person to that person. This week's 15 minutes of hate has been focused on French President Macron. And all of this stems from uh, his speech that he gave on French television in which he essentially called the Aliyev regime the handmaiden of Russia in its aggressions against Armenia. And this has obviously enraged 
the dictator in Baku. And he has actually managed to respond in very strange ways. And let me show you one of the most strange ways that he's responded to this. That was from the official children's television programming in Alayev's kingdom. Uh, and uh, as you see, it is frankly idiotic. However, what we need to see is to read between the lines uh, of this declared war of the Aliyev regime versus President Macron. Uh, he went on in other tweets uh, attacking French colonialism in Algeria and half a dozen different things that he could say negatively about France. Again, all of this silly in the big scheme of things. What is the analysis of all of this? Um, uh, what we're seeing here, uh, and we need to be very careful with this because we're very early in this process and history works itself out and you know, our interpretations can change in a few months. What we are seeing here is it could be that the September invasion of Armenia uh, has not worked out the way that Aliyev had planned. Uh, part of the scheme here was to uh, push this country, isolate it further, and put it into the, push it into the Russian camp uh, even further. Uh, and in fact, it's had the exact opposite effect. Third point here is that the American involvement here is clearly problematic for him for many different reasons, uh, even though there's a case to be made that some of the American proposals are actually in line with what the regime in Baku wants. And the reason that they are problematic for him is that uh, uh, the EU, frankly, was a much better mediator for his purposes because he doesn't have any problem sidelining them or telling them to go to hell. Uh, the United States is much harder to tell the United States to go to hell because actually, after all, it is still the primary power in the world. And it has incredible diplomatic reach and it can essentially make people do things that they don't want or say uh, yes when they actually want to say no. What we're actually seeing here is that he is slowly uh, and systematically being cornered into lining up against the West with his authoritarian friends, whether it is the dictator in uh, in Ankara or the, whether it's uh, the Russian Federation, he's being put into that quarter. And one of the further confirmations of this that we received came from uh, our local regional village idiot, President Lukashenko of Belarus. And like all village idiots, uh, uh, you know, he, usually what he says is not particularly relevant, but like, you know, the clown that he is, he actually sometimes says some things that are quite truthful and revealing. <laughs> Вы с нами или нет, члены ОДКБ, а с другой стороны Азербайджан нельзя. Это неправильно. Азербайджан возглавляет сегодня абсолютно наш человек, Ильхам Алиев. Что будет завтра, он же не вечен, никто не знает. So, oh yeah, President Lukashenko, he actually is your man. In fact, you uh, and your friends and the gangster in Baku have a lot in common. You're actually the last dictators left in Europe, so actually you do have plenty in common. Let's move on to our next topic of the week, which is uh, more of the what I call the Aliyev's crime, war crimes of the week. Uh, and on this segment, I actually want to give a warning because we're going to be talking about things uh, or outlining things in detail, which are actually quite disturbing. So whoever is not comfortable with that should actually skip this portion. Uh, last week, uh, what we received was confirmation. Uh, about war crimes that were committed against the uh, remains of female Armenian soldiers. Uh, the reports show the following. Uh, one of the women had been stripped naked with text written across her breast and stomach. A stone had been placed on her eye socket and a severed finger in her mouth. This was proudly filmed by the IAF soldiers who standing next to the dismembered remains of this woman's soldiers are recorded saying in quotes, Look at that bitch. These are two women. She became a rock. The report uh, goes on to further indicate that the female soldiers were dismembered. Uh, they had their legs cut off, fingers cut off, and stripped naked. 
what can we say about this? You know, there's a lot of commentary in the media and in social media uh, calling uh, Aliyev's gunmen who carried out these war crimes as, uh, uh, as acting like animals. But frankly, I think that is quite unfair to animals who, after all, are one of God's noble creatures and none of the people who carried these out are actually noble in any way. Let's try to understand where some of these actions uh, that were carried out come from. Uh, one thing is, uh, generally, there's, a, there's a, actually a contradiction between democratic regimes and dictatorships. Uh, dictatorships are frankly a lot more honest. It's, it's democratic politicians who frankly lie a lot more often because they need to, to maneuver their way around the complicated political system. Dictatorships are far simpler. Uh, so believe in dictators. When Aleyev uses dehumanizing language, when he calls Armenians animals, uh, when he says he's going to chase the residents of Artsakh, this, uh, out of Artsakh as dogs, believe him. Do not think that's hyperbole. Do not think that's made up. What they say, they actually do. And uh, these savages who were actually carrying these out, this is essentially what you're getting. Uh, you know, the people directly responsible for this are the Aleyev clan that runs that country and has ran it for 50 years since Soviet times. This is a result of 50, I mean, 50 years of Aleyev rule and 30 years of consistent, hateful, pan-Turkic ideology that has been shoved down people's throat and the creation of a national identity which is entirely based, not on anything positive that comes out of their society, is on negative identity, which is their hatred of Armenians of Artsakh, of Armenians in general. The sad thing is, this was not always the case. You know, the first uh, uh, republic that was established in 1918 in Baku uh, was actually the first country, the first Muslim country in the world that actually gave women the right to vote. A hundred years after that, a little more than a hundred years after that, uh, you have these kinds of sadistic actions against female soldiers that are proudly videoed and put out as something that the country should be proud of. Uh, what does this tell us about our neighbor? Uh, in reality, forget about the flag, forget about the respectability of the state that they want to build. At this point, they are really nothing more than the Islamic State with oil wells. In conclusion, we're going to end this broadcast with uh, speaking about the giant rallies that happened in Artsakh about 10 days ago, not this weekend, but the past weekend, uh, which was uh, the people of Artsakh's response to the diplomatic back and forth going on about them. Uh, and what the, why is this important? First of all, I'm fully uh, in line, fully supportive of these efforts and the people who came out in, in their thousands, uh, because it's important for us to understand the centrality of Artsakh to the struggle to this dispute. Without settling the Artsakh issue, you cannot bring long-term peace to this region. And the decision uh, that the world leaders really need to make is, and this is a fundamental one, does the regime in Baku, as it is const currently constituted, have any kind of a legal right to rule the Armenians of Artsakh? Uh, if you want to answer to that question, what I would want to do in an ideal world, I would lock in Mr. Blinken from the United States, whether it's uh, Ursula von der Leyen from the EU, Toivu Klar, lock them into a room and have them for hours watch a loop of these torture videos, dismembered videos, uh, videos of executing POWs. And after they watch that for a couple of hours, once they come out, I'm going to ask them a question. Uh, do you think that that regime in Baku has a right to rule the people of Artsakh? Uh, and if your answer is no, that you cannot ask the people, the residents of Artsakh, to live under a murderous, gangrenous regime whose primary mission is their physical destruction. Thank you for joining me in these sort of insights. Out of the huts of history's shame I rise, up from a past rooted in pain I rise, a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling and bearing in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise.